You're more than a chef, though. Brian's a chef. He's a cookbook author. He's a creative. He's a James Beard, recognized, award-winning um, social activist. He is a uh, curator of such at a museum. This is Chef Brian Terry, y'all, my good friend. He is a trailblazer. He definitely <laughs> Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so, how many of y'all like hip hop? A couple of y'all? Okay. So, I was telling Nicole that um, this weekend, the reason I'm on the East Coast is because I was in New Jersey and I got a chance to uh, do an event with um, y'all like Wu Tang Clan? So, I got a chance to do an event with RZA this weekend. And so, I've been thinking a lot about hip hop and I've been thinking a lot about why I started being interested in food issues. And it was a hip hop song that really changed the game for me. So I, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't kick the lyrics to this song for y'all. So can I do that? Yeah. I'll go with this. All right. So I'm gonna take y'all back. This is before. No, this is back when they had these things that we listen to music on called tapes. It's this little plastic <laughs> receptacle. <laughs> so um, this is 1990. And I heard this song, and so I grew up in the South. I'm from Memphis. I lived in Brooklyn for 10 years. I live in the Bay Area now in Oakland. But I grew up in the South. My family had farms, so I was always around fresh, good food. But, you know, I ate everything. I was an omnivore. As you see, the title of my book is Afro-Vegan. You guys know what vegan is, right? I don't need to explain that. Um, and so I had this moment in 1990 when I heard this song and this really changed the game for me when I decided that I wanted to be a food activist and I wanted to change the way that I ate and I wanted to stop eating meat. And so I'm going to kick it like this, but I want to do this. If after I kick the lyrics, if you could tell me the name of the song and if you could tell me and we can't do any Shazam or you can't look it up or anything. <laughs> and if you could tell me the, um, the name of the hip hop artist. I'll send you, I'll send Nicole a copy of my uh, book, Afro Vegan, to uh, pass it along to you, all right? <clears throat> so it goes a little something like this. Beef, what a relief. When will this poisonous product cease? This is another public service announcement. You can believe it or you can doubt it. Let us begin now with the cow, the way that it gets to your plate and how. The cow doesn't grow fast enough for man, so through his greed, he creates a faster plan. He has drugs to make the cow grow quicker. Through the stress, the cow gets sicker. 21 different drugs are pumped into the cow in one big lump. And just before it dies, it cries in a slaughterhouse full of germs and flies. It gets much more graphic, so I'm gonna stop there. But, uh, <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> any, any, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Any takers? Any takers? Not Ice Cube. <laughs> this is some old school hip hop. This is a pioneering hip hop groove. Who? Nah, nah. I'm gonna tell you to burrow. Maybe this, maybe this will help you out. South Bronx. Care as what? Oh, you you said that? Oh, my bad. My bad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is so this is a type. You said you said it's KRS One, y'all. You want to go like, what's the song? Oh wow, I heard it. I heard it when you spin it. I heard his voice. Okay. I, he the only one that spit on knowledge, though. He the only one that spit knowledge from back in the days. That's why I know. I noticed that it's me. So I'm gonna send two copies. I give one to him and one to him because they both said the um, artist. So KRS One, Boogie Down Productions. You know, one of the pioneering groups in hip hop, they call him the teacher, knowledge reigns supreme over nearly everyone. And for me, this song was so pivotal because I had no idea how horribly animals can be treated in our industrialized food system. Now, I'm not talking about a farm where people take care of the animals and they might slaughter them to eat. I'm talking about an industrialized, do have y'all heard this term factory farming before? Yes, yeah. Can you tell us what that means? Oh. Yep. And um, they, their sole purpose is just for eating. Their only breeding is just for, to kill them and for the milk. Like they kind of yeah. No, that's it. 
it's just like the only thing that these companies care about a profit now i'm not gonna i'm not the person that's gonna sit here and tell you um that no one should eat meat because i don't necessarily believe that i think that if we look at the traditional diets of people of african descent we can go to west and central africa we can go to the caribbean we can go to the american south traditional diets are mostly vegetable based. I will say that. Did, was meat used? Yes. You know, meat would be used as a seasoning. It would be used to like flavor things. But the only time people were like having like a whole hog or like, you know, just huge pieces of meat on a plate is on holidays and special occasions and things like that. Now, the reason I'm saying all this is because I don't know if y'all have ever felt this or had this um, image, but a lot of people have this idea that eating like vegetarianism or vegetarian or eating vegan is like a white thing. Have y'all heard that before? Yeah. Is that something like, so a lot of people have this misperception and part of it is because this Australian um, philosopher, this white guy, Peter Singer, came out with this book in 1975 called Animal Liberation, where he was talking about how horribly animals are treated. And basically his premise was this, it's like animals are human, they're, they're living beings, right? Just like us. And we like to think that because they're a lower form of an animal that they don't have feelings or they don't have any like you know family structure and we could just do whatever we want to them and he's like no these are living beings we need to treat them respectfully so <clears throat> because of that a lot of people feel like oh you know that veganism that's some white people stuff and i heard like a lot of our people say that but let me just say this in terms of like who i learned about this type of like lifestyle and eating from it's all black folks you know what i mean we could talk about I i'll start here if any of you Seventh Day Adventists or have members, any of you um, Rasta, have any Rastafarianism? Okay. Um, Hebrew Israelite. So, what I want to make clear is if we look at the 20th century, throughout the 20th century, there have been black people who've been talking about these issues. A lot of it's theologically driven. Seven Day Adventists. The first time I heard about eating vegetarian or eating vegan, veganism was from black Seven Day Adventists. When I was learning about truly how to like make good vegan food, it was from Rastafarians in Memphis, where I grew up. They talk about the Ital diet. Y'all know what that is? Can you tell them what the Ital diet is? Can you speak up a little bit? Right, so it's a clean diet. It's a vegetable-based diet. Um, we could talk about, I don't know if y'all heard of this comedian and social justice activist, Dick Gregory. Have y'all heard of him? Yeah. He's more old school. He wrote this book in the 1970s called, um, no, let me, let me stop there. Before I talk about him, y'all know about the Nation of Islam, right? Yeah. So Elijah Muhammad, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had a book called How to Eat to Live. And it was all about how we can reject what he said the white man's diet, which, you know, for me, I take that as a metaphor for industrialized food system, a food system that's driven on profits. And that's the whole thing. And, and, and I'm not going to get too deep into this, but I will say this. <clears throat> we live in an economic system that you all are aware of called capitalism, right? And I think we're in a moment where a lot of people worship money. They worship money. They think that people who have money are somehow like the people we should be looking up to. And I'm not saying that, I mean, we all should have our basic needs met. We all should be financially stable. But this idea that money is the be all to end all is the reason that we exploit animals. It's the reason right now we're in an environmental crisis because these corporations whose sole purpose is to create profits for their shareholders is the reason why our Water is being poisoned by chemical pesticides. The air is being poisoned. The soil is being poisoned. And so I'm not, I'm concerned about it for us, but you know who I'm really concerned about it for? My, my four-year-old daughter and my seven-year-old daughter because things are getting markedly worse. We talk about climate change and you know, people have been talking about this for decades, but if you look around what's happening globally, like the world is unraveling. And so I'm saying all this to say that for me, like when I talk about food, my entry into the food system was about trying to create a better earth, trying to like create something that was better for my children and my grandchildren. And so 
I started off here in the, oh, so I was talking about, um, you know, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, How to Eat to Live, Dick Gregory, Karis One. So I'm just saying this to say that there are black people, people of African descent, African, Afro-Caribbean, African-American who talk about these things. And I feel like it's something that we need to own, right? This is nothing like white people don't need to tell us how to eat. And there's this paternalistic way in which I see a lot of white people who eat healthfully, eat vegan. They're like, they feel like they need to educate black folks. Like we need to tell y'all poor black people how to eat better. Cause we know, cause I mean, we know, you all know, right? That our communities have some of the highest rates of what? Hypertension, high blood pressure, right? So these are all what they say are preventable diet related illnesses, meaning that we can actually do a lot to control these illnesses by what we eat. You know what I mean? We don't have to be taking all this medicine. Y'all know about the pharmaceutical industry, another industry that's driven solely on profits. Do y'all not think that these doctors who are pushing pills to our people to bring the blood pressure down, to bring all this thing, they're getting paid. They're putting money into the pharmaceutical industry like, yo, you get them the pills that we make and we'll slide you $150,000, you know what I mean? And so what we need to do is we have to take control of our health and our diet. And I think a lot of that means that we just need to eat less meat, you know what I mean? Not that we need to cut it out, but they have studies that show if you just cut the meat that you're consuming in half, that can like increase your lifespan by like 10 years. And along with that, what I'm saying is, when we talk about eating healthily, that don't mean it gotta be like some quinoa with some cucumbers and like some tomatoes. That mean that our foods, black food, the foods that we eat traditionally, we can flip it and we can make it healthy, right? So I moved to New York City. I was a graduate student at NYU and <clears throat> there was something that started to trouble me. I'd be on the subway in the morning at like seven o'clock in the morning going to um, campus. And then I would see young people, you know, younger than you are, like high school students on the train at seven o'clock in the morning doing what? Eating <laughs> red eye Cheetos. <laughs> yup. Fast food, <laughs> Starburst, candy, sugary little um, energy drinks. <clears throat> and so, so y'all, slushies, all that. So y'all know the game. I was really troubled by this because I knew that this is, that was a breakfast for these young people, right? We know food is medicine. We know food is fuel. We have studies. There is a growing body of research that connects what we eat, proper nutrition, proper diet with academic outcomes, with behavioral outcomes, with your ability to just be still and be present. You know what I mean? You, you wonder, we wonder why so many kids in our community are being diagnosed with things like ADHD, all these things. It's because they're not eating, it's the, the sugar in their diets. Then, what'd you say, brother? <laughs> I want to make something clear to y'all. And I don't know if this is something that, you know, the organizers, the program coordinators have talked to y'all about, but I really want you to imagine yourselves and understand that y'all are healers, right? We often think about people who've gone to medical school for four years and done residency and gotten all these certifications, but the people who are doing the work of feeding people, y'all are healers. Like y'all literally, like this idea that food is medicine, it's a reality. And, I'm, and, and let me say this, I'm not saying that there isn't a role for Western medicine. Like if I break my arm, don't bring me a kale salad. <laughs> Call 911 send the ambulance so that I can go get my arm fixed and put a cast on it. Like there's a role for Western medicine, but there is certainly no need for us to address these things that we can do if we change the way we eat, if we exercise, if we meditate and take care of ourselves to give you a pill. Because the pill, y'all know what the pills are doing. They're just suppressing the symptoms, right? They're not healing the root of the problem. And so, that's one thing. Another thing is, I don't know if y'all know that a lot of these pharmaceuticals, so they, I'll give you an example. Have y'all, y'all heard of Rogaine, right? Yeah. So Rogaine is like marketed as um, a hair growth product, right? Originally, this product was created to actually lower blood pressure. They were like doing like lab studies. I'm pretty sure it was um, blood pressure, but they saw one of the side effects was that it made hair grow. Wow. So the company, they pivoted, and then they were like, well, we're gonna market this as a hair growth product. 
But just think about, you know, and, and y'all have heard about like these different pills. It's like, well, you could take this to help your blood pressure, but it might um, make your liver expand. It might make your throat swell up, you know, all these different things. And so, you know, once again, there is a role for some medicines, but food should be our medicine. And so I started this organization called Be Healthy, which is, is similar to this program. It's not as vocational. It was really about just helping young people in some of our most vulnerable neighborhoods understand the, the power of food in their lives. And so we, we were based at this place. I don't know if y'all heard of a place called The Door in Manhattan? Yeah. yeah, so we were based in The Door and we worked with students from all over the city. And what we did was we would have cooking workshops. We would have classes. We would take them to the farmer's market. We would go to farms because we wanted them to understand that no food, your carrots do not come from a plastic wrap container in the supermarket. And I know y'all know this, but a lot of the young people we came in, they didn't know that. They didn't know that carrots come from the soil. They didn't know that, you know, they weren't these little cute little like cut out things. It's like a real big ugly root that you pull from the ground and then you could like prepare it. What'd you say? <laughs> and, and, and these things aren't taught in school. Did, did, did any of y'all go to school to have like, um, you know, like an industrial, like the kitchen? Right? Because y'all know back in the way in like the 70s and the 80s, they used to have home ec, right? Where they actually would use these kitchens and they would have like culinary programs in school. So these are like basic life skills that I think every young person should be learning so that they can go into um, their adult lives. So um, we started the program, Be Healthy. We work with kids. And part of the goal is we also wanted them to be community activists. Um, Nicole told me this, I had no idea that Brownsville has a high concentration of community gardens throughout the community. I, I didn't know that. But <clears throat> another myth that I really wanted to um, address was this idea that just because a community you know, might not be a affluent community just because it might be, uh, you know, black and brown that it's somehow like the ghetto and everybody's just, you know, lazy, not doing anything. Y'all know the stereotypes they make about our communities. And so I wanted these young people to know that once again, this is our heritage. We come from agrarian backgrounds. Our people were transported from West and Central Africa for the specific purpose of being in the agricultural industry. And it wasn't like it was some accident. They knew that if you took people from the Senegambia region, they knew how to grow rice in Africa. So we're going to move them down to South Carolina, which is a similar coastal area, because they know how to grow rice. So nobody needs to teach us this stuff. These are our traditions. You know who we need to talk to, though? The grandmas the aunties, the people who are holding this knowledge, the cooks, the, the, the farmers, the gardeners and everything. So anyway, I'm gonna skip ahead to when I decided to start writing books. I really felt like it was important for me to move the work that I was doing in New York City and have a national platform. And so my first book, I wrote it with my friend in 2006. This is my um, fourth book, which was published in 2014 and inspired by hip hop inspired by collage, by visual artists. Um, I don't know if y'all heard this cat, Romare Bearden. He was an artist here in New York City. And there was actually, um, you should check this out, Nicole. There was an article, a really good article about Romare Bearden, who is like one of the most celebrated black visual artists of the 20th century. And he was a social worker. He was doing his art on the side. During the daytime, he was like working with young people, working with communities. So anyway, I decided to start writing books. One of the, um, so my approach to cookbook writing is like a, um, a, a hip hop producer or a DJ or collages. I like to think about like the flavors, the spices, the ingredients and kind of cut and paste and rework and bring things together that might, you know, be familiar, but that's something new. Each recipe in my book, one of the signatures has a suggested soundtrack. So, um, you know, whatever. Um, I mean, whatever music inspire me. You know, I'll put a soundtrack in there and then I do a mix that I put on iTunes and SoundCloud and all that. And so, you know, for me, it's really about celebrating our food, celebrating our heritage and doing it through the lens of plant based cooking. And I'm saying this to say that this is just a tool. When I put my books out, I tell people, look, I don't expect everybody to be vegan. I don't expect people to give up meat. But what I do want us to do is understand. I mean, do y'all can y'all all agree? Can we agree that we could eat a little more? fruits and vegetables, we all could probably do a little bit of that, you know? And, and that's what I want us to do. I want us to know that if we can do that, that's one step to helping us be healthier. 
And I really feel like it's about like doing it with the foods that are culturally appropriate, the foods of our culture. And so um, I'm happy to be here with y'all. I'm, I'm learning about what y'all doing and this is a blessing. Can I say something? You can say a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Word up. I mean, y'all know about GMOs, right? Y'all know about conventional produce that's sprayed with all these chemical pesticides. Here's the thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave y'all with this and then I can open up for questions if y'all have any or comments or whatever. I talk about the three C's of change, right? Because what I've seen happening over the past two decades when I've been doing this work is a lot of people, they're like, yo, I'm about this food movement. I really want to like change the way that I eat, change the way that my family eat. So I'm going to make different cho changes or choices as a consumer, right? I'm going to spend my money differently. I think it's important for us to recognize that as consumers, as people who spend our money, every dollar we spend is a vote for the type of food system we want to see. So if you spend your money at McDonald's, that is saying to McDonald's that, you know, we're gonna thrive. This is a market that we're fulfilling and we're helping it out. But if we go to the farmer's market and you spend your money at the farmer's market, you're helping your neighbors, right? <clears throat> and let me put it like this. Y'all been to the farmer's market right before? Okay, so you go to the farmer's market, you actually get to meet the people who grow in your food. Every dollar that you spend at the farmer's market, the farmer, the actual people growing the food, they get between 88 cents and $90, 90 cents for every dollar you spend, right? When you go to the supermarket, it's the exact opposite. Like 10 cents that you spend, if it's grown by like a small farmer or something like that, goes to the farmer. The most of the money is going towards things like marketing, shipping, packaging. I mean, y'all know so much of the food that everyone around the country eats comes from California. It's sitting on trucks and refrigerators for weeks. So I'm saying all of this to say that it's important for us to understand that we can make change as consumers, but that's not enough. The second change is what y'all are doing, community change. I think we need to be in the trenches. We need to be working in our communities, the communities that are most impacted by these things, like diet-related diet illnesses, and we need to be getting skills like you are getting, that you can use. Because guess what? Right now, y'all are being taught, y'all the students, but I guarantee y'all are gonna be teaching this to other people at some point. You're gonna be passing along these skills and we have to like grow that exponentially where we're like teaching the young people, helping them to have these skills that they can take in their life. And the last thing, and I'll say this, and I'm not saying that the promised land or like utopia is gonna come from voting. There are a lot of flaws in voting, but we need to be engaged as citizens, right? We need to understand that every vote, like the people we put in office, is actually gonna impact every, I mean, look, we see what's happening now, right? I mean, we know this fool stole the election, so that's all the issue, but we understand that when we put people in office who don't care about our communities and who only care about their rich cronies and put more, pocket, more money in the pockets of their rich cronies, everybody else is gonna suffer. So, you know, I don't know if all y'all have a voting age and if you even vote, but I wanna encourage you to like understand that y'all have the power through your vote to make sure we putting people, we're putting people in office who care about us, who care about our communities, and who aren't just in the back pockets of these corporations. Because that's what happened. Y'all know about the lobbyists. These, lobby these corporations pay lobbyists, and they are the ones, they're putting like all this money in the pockets of these politicians. So when it comes to things like climate change, they're like, we don't believe in that. Climate change don't even exist. What are you talking about? Why do we need regulations for the environment? There was an um, article I saw in the New York Times uh, maybe it was just online, but it was back, it was actually showing the United States before the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, was uh, created, and how like crazy stuff was because there was no regulation. It was like the Wild West. Like corporations could do whatever they want to do. They could like smoke communities with all their like you know chemicals. They could poison the water. And guess what? When we let them run rampant like that, guess whose communities suffer the most? Our communities. Are you think they're putting these? Um, factories on the Upper East Side? You think they're putting these factories in the Hamptons? No, they're putting these type of things in our community. So I'm, I just want to encourage y'all to think about like how we need to be um, engaged 
as voters and we need to make that happen. Y'all heard about this woman, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, this Latina woman up in the Bronx. Y'all know, y'all heard about her? This woman's bout it, bout it. She's like, I'm a socialist. I'm a democratic socialist. She's like, what do I believe in? I believe everybody should have health care. I believe that, you know, all people have the right to like a good education. You know, I believe all people should have a living wage, not just a minimum wage, but a wage that can actually take care of their families. And so there are a lot more people who are going to be coming out to woodworks like her. And we need to make sure that we get those type of people in office and not people like this orange clown in the White House. Mm-hmm.